What's up, Hope City Church? Pastors Daniel and Jackie Groves here. And we just wanna officially welcome you to the weekend experience. We're so excited about what God is doing here. And we're in our summer session series. That's right, this is week three mm -hmm. of our summer sessions. Yep. And we're doing something super special today. We're making history this weekend. But first, if this is your first time at Hope City, we would love to just, hello, say hello. This is me saying hello, this is us. Saying hello. Oh, so great that you're here. We are we are happy to introduce ourselves to you. We are actually the lead pastors. We are, we are, yeah. yep. <laughs> and if you're new to Hope City, uh, then welcome home. And if you call Hope City home, welcome back. If you've missed the first two weeks of summer sessions, you need to go back to our YouTube channel. Pastor Kevin Luke has brought the heat. Pastor Wayne Francis, if you missed it, you need to go back because it was mind-blowing and then today we're making history we've never done this before at hope city we call this three by ten three by ten elbow the person next to you and say three. three look at your second choice and say ten can you break it down so three by ten so we have three different speakers from inside of mm -hmm. our hope city team yep. and they are going to be sharing 10 minute segments all connected, bringing you three different points on a powerful, powerful topic. And it is going to just come together in such a great revelational way. We're excited. We're so excited. You know him, you love him. Would you stand your feet and welcome to the stage, our first communicator for 3 by 10 Rodney yeah. Douglas. Hello, family. How y'all feeling today? I love y'all so much. Go ahead and be seated, be seated. I am so grateful, so grateful for this opportunity. This is my first time serving in this capacity here at Hope City. And I can't move forward without giving honor and thanks to our pastors, Pastor Daniel and Jackie Groves. Love you so much. They're always thinking of new, fresh, innovative ways to get you the word of the Lord. And listen, I've been fasting and I've been praying and I truly do believe that God has a special and unique word for your life. So if you're watching at Katie Woodlands online in the overflow in the room, I want you to pay attention for a second. I know you may have had a long week. I know you may be going through a very rough time, but I want to let you know today that you're in the right place at the right time to receive a word from the Lord. Amen. Amen. So we're going to hop into this thing. As pastor said, this is what we call a three by 10. And if you're taking notes, the topic that I'll be teaching on along with the other communicators is this, how to run your race well. I'll say that again, how to run your race well. And the point that I've been entrusted to break down today is this, step one, the takeoff. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for every individual who hears the sound of my voice. And I pray that this message would ignite a brand new faith, a brand new aspect and understanding of your word. And I believe that as they go through this week, they will go through this week change. They will go through this week with a new perspective. And we thank you for it and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, give God praise all over this room. So check this out. I was born and raised in a Pentecostal church. My father has been pastoring since I was three years old, Pastor Rodney Douglas Sr. And one thing I loved about that church is when the word resonated with an individual in the audience, they would shout, amen. They would shout, God, I love you. They would just holler out and that, that encouraged me. So I want to let you know this morning, can we just be a talk back church? So let's do some practice. If you know God is good, can you shout amen? amen. Oh, y'all ready to go. Let's jump into it. So listen, I want to tell a funny story. Years and years ago, we were at a family reunion and we were about to play a kickball game. And as I previously stated before, my father was a pastor. So if you know anything about pastors, pastors are enthusiastic. They are vocal and all of the things. So my dad, he got there. He said, you know what? I still got it. Don't y'all forget, I can still play. I can still win this game. I'm about to kick this ball, and I'm about to show y'all who's boss. And I'm going to tell you this, I believed him, because he was a man that I can trust. So, 
He gets up and it's, turn, it's his turn to kick. So me and my sisters, we're prepared for the worst. So he gets back. He takes off. He runs like this. So when he does that, he means business. And he kicks the ball. And when I tell you, I've never seen somebody kick a ball so hard in my life. I thought his foot was about to fall off. So he kicked the ball and it went flying. And so as soon as he took off, he took off running. But as we were all paying attention, I noticed the more he ran, the closer he got to the ground. And I, I had to double take. I said, surely there's not a staircase or an elevator. So why is my father running to the ground? And y'all know the rest of the story. He fell and we all laughed and laughed and laughed. And the moral of the story is this. After the game, he realized this. He said, son, I had to get on my good foot. I didn't, I, my takeoff wasn't, wasn't what it needed to be. And I learned this in racing and running, that if you don't take off the proper way, you'll lose the race or you'll fall to the ground. So I'm grateful to be able to break down this first point, the takeoff. Are y'all ready to hear the steps of how to take off in running your race? All right, let's go. So step one is this. It's very simple. Just say yes. God wants your whole heart and desires to have a daily relationship with you. And this is how it starts. Really simple. Romans 10 and 9 says this, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him, that is Jesus, from the dead, you will be saved. It's that simple. That's why we do all that we do here at Hope City, the events and the services and the worship. We do this so that you can experience Jesus for yourself. Amen? That's point one. Step two is this. Snap out of it. I want you to look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, snap out of it. Don't say it too loud. I see somebody, who are you talking to? No. I promise I'm not trying to call anyone in this room crazy, but I know oftentimes we can be blinded by our situations and our circumstances and our worries and our weight goals and our life goals and our dreams and our visions and we get overwhelmed and we forget what is truth. Well, I've come to remind you today the truth is this. God is with you. Come on, somebody get excited about that. God is is with you in every step. He's with you in every storm. He's with you in every sickness. He's with you in every no. God is with you. The Bible even tells us in Isaiah 41 and 10, it says, so do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. I want to let you know, Hope City, you are not alone, but you have full access to Jesus. But we must build our faith on a firm foundation. We have to build our faith on a firm foundation if we plan to take off and go anywhere. 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 says this. We walk by faith and not by sight. That's right. And the best way to walk by faith is to have daily fellowship with the Father and get his word down on the inside of you. The Bible says, thy word have I hidden in my heart so that I won't sin against thee. That's right. I got a church that knows that word. I like that. So in this race, I want to encourage you to not look at what's in front of you, but to rely completely on what is on the inside of you. I'm going to say that again. Don't worry about what is in front of you, what you see, but rely on the power and the strength and the assurance that is on the inside of you. And that is the power of the Holy Spirit. Step three, this is my favorite part right here. Y'all ready for this? This is what I said in the, be in the beginning. Take off. I want you to shout that out. Say, take, take off. off. Get started. You have to get started and do what God put on your heart to do. One thing I've come to realize is that God won't give you any directive, vision, or dream that he will not equip you to complete. I'm going to say that again for the ones in the back. I said, God won't give you any directive, vision, or dream that he will not equip you to complete. Oftentimes, we can get fearful and feel like we're not qualified. And the truth is, you may not be qualified, but because of the word of the Lord in Philippians 4 and 13, I've come to let you know today, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I need somebody with some faith to shout that out. Say, I can do 
all things through Christ that strengthens me hallelujah that ignited my faith hallelujah and then it's time for us as believers to walk in power and authority the authority that has been given to us through Christ Jesus and all throughout scriptures you'll find stories of how supernatural faith seen God's people through Hope City I'll come to let you know today that your faith is enough I'm gonna say that again your faith is enough your faith is enough to get started your faith is enough to see you through your circumstance your faith is enough to stand on a firm foundation and get started your faith is enough your faith is enough to speak mountains and tell the mountains to move your faith is enough to look sickness in the face and declare healing your faith is simply enough to take off in this race somebody just shout that out say my faith is enough Hallelujah. And I love the word of God so much because um, in all of the different Bible stories, you'll see these people with this supernatural faith. And when you read the stories, it looks like they are about to get defeated and they're about to get destroyed. But God showed up every time. And I'm going to tell you a few of these stories in the Bible. I'm sure David, who was in the face of a giant named Goliath, had no idea how he was going to defeat that giant. But he knew that his faith, what, was enough. I'm sure when the Israelites got to the Red Sea they had no idea how they were going to escape the Egyptians but their leader Moses he stood there and put a rod in the ground and he parted that Red Sea why because he knew that his faith was enough and I'm even sure that Daniel in the face of a lion in the face of a beast had no idea how his arms his puny arms were going to defeat this beast but Daniel knew that his faith was enough I've come to let you know Hope City this morning that the common denominator in all of these individuals is they had to recognize that their faith was enough. Their faith was enough. I want to let you know this, that victory belongs to those who believe and your faith is enough for you to get started. So as you go through this week, I want you to walk through this week with your chest held high, with your head held up, knowing that your faith is enough to see you through. Yes, there's going to be trials. Yes, there's going to be mountains. Yes, you're going to be in the face of giants. But I want to empower you this week that no weapon that is formed against you will be able to prosper. I'm going to say that again for the one in the back. No weapon that is formed against you will be able to prosper. So I want you to walk. I want you to get in the right posture on a firm foundation and stand on his word and when you're ready to take off and that gun goes off I want you to run and I don't want you to look back I want you to run knowing that God is running right beside you I want you to run and know that you have the power to do all things so in this moment can we all lift our hands as we're standing on a firm foundation we're going to end it like this Christ is my firm foundation Come on, by faith. The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaking Hallelujah. I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Yes, Lord. Cause he's never letting me down He's faithful through generations yeah so why would he fail now shout it out he won't somebody give god praise come on praise him like you know he's not gonna fail praise him like you know he's right there in the middle of the storm with you praise him like you're ready to run this race hallelujah i'm gonna knock this thing over well listen i want y'all to make some noise and let's celebrate our next communicator pastor Kristen barber Amazing. Can we give it up for Rodney? Show him honor. Oh my goodness. Are y'all awake this morning? You ready to go? It's awesome. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Gosh, so grateful for these powerful communicators who have just been through some stuff and know about the power of God. Amen. 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 So Rodney kicked us off with how to take off and how to start strong and be successful in our race. And I get the honor to share with you about the middle 
part of the race, the in-between seasons, the routine part, the hard work part. Amen? But before we dive into that, I would love to know, take a little quick poll, how many of you guys actually like to run in the house? How many, right? I love it. Um, like, like one mile, five miles, any track stars, high school track, college, right? It's amazing. Gosh, you're my heroes, right? I love to run, but I only love to run because in the busyness of life, I'm thinking about two things. I'm thinking about breathing and moving my arms and legs. That's it. Nothing else is in my mind but that. So it's actually very, very relaxing. But when you are racing, even if, even if it's just field day back in elementary school, you know what I'm talking about. When you are jogging or racing, there comes a point where you are like, I don't think I'm gonna make it. I'm not gonna make it. And our legs feel like a thousand pounds and we have these sharp, pains in our sides that feel like knives, right? And our heart's like five times the size in our chest, and we're just not going to make it. And if anyone has any teenagers or preteens in the room, and you've had to coach your kid through that moment that they think they're going to die, I'm like, no, no, sis, we're going to push past this, right? We're going to push on past this. But that's why I'm not a personal trainer. That's why I don't own my own gym, because I would say all the time, but did you die? (laughs) And then if you didn't, we're going to keep working. We're going to keep working really, really hard. We have some things in our life that are hard. We have some struggles, some habits, some sins, some trauma that we have to get past. So today we're going to talk about the hurdles in life that we experience in the middle part of our journey. Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Other translations say the author and finisher of our faith. Our Lord is so very intentional. So we're going to talk about some hurdles this morning. The first hurdle is the hurdle of the ordinary. The hurdle of the ordinary, our everyday life. We have started our race, right? Now we're trying to find our pace, find our stride. How much work is this really going to be? How long is this going to take me? I need to get my mind wrapped around this. We love the mountaintops, but we don't love the hard work in the valleys. We don't love the flatlands. We love the new beginnings and the excitement and the newness of it all, but then life will settle in and we have to work hard. We have to stay disciplined. We have to stay consistent in our walk with the Lord. We have to get up and do our first 20. We have to pray and worship and read our word. We have to give a space for the Lord to talk to us in the middle parts of our season. Galatians 6, 9 says, so let's not grow tired of doing what is good at just the right time time, at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we do not give up. Amen? So I know I am probably not, like I'm probably more rare, not common because of this specific trait. I'm a very disciplined person and consistent person when it comes to my nutrition and my fitness and all things health. I know what it's done for me in my life. I know what it's done for my mental health in my life. My family knows if I have not worked out for a couple of days, I'm telling you. Um, But oftentimes people who are consistent in that area marry people, people who maybe aren't as consistent in that area. And so Brandon is not super consistent in his way. He would tell he's so self-aware in this. I promise you, he knows he would be up here nodding his head. He knows he's not the most disciplined person he wants to be. And he tells, he says, babe, I'm going to start every, every Monday. I'm going to start Monday. I'm going to start Monday. You know, it's the weekend and he's going to go, he's going to start Monday. But the thing about it, because he's been an athlete for so long, 
he can just walk out to our garage and bench press whatever, whatever that number is that all of you guys know that's supposed to be super awesome. He's able to do that after taking months, months off. And it's so frustrating. I am not happy for him in that moment. I am not celebrating him in that moment. But then it kind of hits him a couple of minutes later and he says, babe, where could I be if I had just stayed consistent? How much stronger would I be right now if I had just stayed consistent? Because consistency isn't about being perfect. Consistency is about being committed. That's what our Lord Jesus wants. He doesn't want perfection. He never asks for perfection. He just wants us to show up and give him an opportunity to work in our life and to make us stronger. He doesn't want perfection. He just wants us to stay committed. Another hurdle that a lot of us struggle with is the hurdle of comparison. I know, it got quiet, both services, ooh. The hurdle of comparison. I remember racing and then, you know, maybe I wouldn't be in first place a couple of times and then I would see in in my side view someone else creeping up and I'm like, oh no ma'am, no, 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 no. There's gonna be one winner and that's gonna be me. So then I would kick it into gear. But this comparison, we always see people on our side that we think, we think on their path are a little bit further ahead of us. Comparison gets a bad rep. It honestly does, because as a part of a community of faith, a community that loves Jesus, we have brothers and sisters in Christ. We can learn, we can evaluate, we can assess, we can examine other people's paths and journeys and races, and we can learn from them. Maybe they have some habits that we don't have that we could instill in our lives. Maybe they have some victories and some things the Lord has taught them that we can learn. So comparison can be a very healthy thing, but it can also be a completely controlling thing if we allow it to. It controls our thoughts. It controls our motives. It controls our decisions. We're accomplishment-oriented and so of understanding that God has a path for me laid out clearly and trusting in the Lord. I have a friend who is in, he was in an industry and he was very frustrated that he was not further along in his career and his title and his um, bank account. And so uh, Brendan and I were trying to counsel him through this and he was doing everything that everyone else was doing and they were getting rewarded. He was in touch with all of his college buddies and they were further ahead than him. And he's like, I just don't understand it. So Brendan and I were talking and we were trying to figure out how to relate. Like, Lord, give us the words to relate to him. And so the next time we got to meet with him, the Lord told me, he said, tell him that I asked him to run his race. I didn't ask him to win every time. I asked him to run his race, but not to win every time. Guys, think about in our minds, if we thought we had to have the biggest bank account, the prettiest house, right? The perfect body, the perfect speech, every other thing, we would be miserable because we would always be comparing ourselves to everyone else. And God's like, I asked you to run because the prize is salvation and the prize is his kingdom and the prize is bringing other people to heaven and populating heaven. That's what our prize and motivation and our joy is. Comparison makes life all about the wrong perspective. It keeps us self-focused and it's just like a moving target, guys. Comparison's a moving target. That moving target then becomes a cycle and it just overflows to every single area of our life. We start questioning God, why aren't we where they are? Which then It builds distrust in us. We're not trusting God if we're always questioning him why you're not further ahead or why isn't that happening for me. So he's saying, trust in me and understand that comparison is not my game plan for you. Don't let it control you. Let it fuel you and learn from those in around you. Comparison steals our focus and it steals our contentment. Philippians says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content. 
Whatever the circumstances, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. If you can leave that up there for just a second. Does that scripture say that Paul was born with contentment? He learned contentment. He learned contentment because the Lord brought him through some things. That homeboy had to struggle. He had to learn. The Lord provided for him and he saved him. And so he learned this contentment because of his experiences. So sometimes, guys, we're going to have to pull up our bootstraps and we're going to have to tell ourselves, I will be content in this season and I will have joy in this season. I may not have every single thing that I want, but I have way more than I deserve because the Lord has saved me. The Lord has freed me. The Lord has been my truth. His word has been a lamp unto my feet. He has saved me. He has saved my family. He has protected me. He has healed me. He has exchanged my heaviness for garments of praise. The Lord has been my strong tower. He has been your strong tower. He has been your mighty warrior. The Lord can be your king contentment if you allow yourself to remember all that he has done in your life. Say, I will not let the enemy steal my contentment. Because guys, God uses this middle season. He has a purpose in this season if you will allow him to show that to you, if you will allow him to work in that. Because I promise you, out of my 39 years, he has wasted nothing. He has wasted no season. And so the Lord God will not waste what you're going through if you keep on going and allowing him to be your contentment. Amen? Amen. Amen. If you guys could go ahead and stand up, we're going to introduce our next speaker. Are y'all ready? You going to buckle up? Join me in a welcoming Pastor Andy Liao. Woo! Amen and amen. How many of you are enjoying today's message? Isn't God good? You may be seated. Wow. You know, I just find it so beautiful that we serve a God that can makes, a, makes us so different and unique in our spiritual giftings. And to see the Holy Spirit just thread that message of the gospel together, it's just a beautiful thing that only our God can do. And I feel today's message and today's approach is, is a beautiful picture of what our God can do. But hey, I've got a long way to go and a short time to get there, so I'm going to go right, back, right into this. Are you all ready for that? All right. Now, I'm going to start off by being really open and transparent. Is that okay? I don't know how to be any other way. Okay, so when I found out that today's message and theme was based on running your race, I had to go to the googly goo search and find some stuff out about running because you already know I know nothing about running, okay? Now, don't judge me. I I didn't even know that people ran for fun until I started dating Cindy. I'll never forget, we went to our old high school track, Jersey Village High. Go Falcons, anybody there? And we're just talking and dating, and we're walking on the track, and out of nowhere, she just bolts and hauls. And I'm like, what is happening? And I'm trying to figure it out. So naturally, I'm just going to follow right behind her because I thought homegirl stole something. I was like, what is happening? with my life right now. And that was me just trying to show her, hey, I'm ride or die. I'm gonna be here with you wherever you go. I'm gonna be right behind you, okay, girl? That's what I'm gonna do. But no, turns out that Cindy's a long distance runner. And come to find out that the only way I'm gonna run a 40 yard dash is when I'm playing Madden on my PlayStation. But in all seriousness, I did look up how relay races work. And I learned that the last person to pick up the baton is called the anchor. The anchor is the one that brings it down the home stretch. Focus on the finish line. And the second he gets the baton, everybody is focused on the finish line. And let me tell you something today. We're on the home stretch of today's message. 
The finish line is right in front of us. So I'm going to ask you today, focus on the finish. So say it with me. Focus on the finish. Rodney showed us that in order to take off, we have to take our first step. And that first step is taken on the foundation of our faith because of what Christ did on that cross. Amen? Pastor Kristen then spoke and said, hey, the Bible calls us overcomers. And that sounds great. But the only thing that guarantees is that we have to overcome something. We have hurdles in life that come our way. But we can persevere. And today, I wanted to talk to you about finishing well. I've always been fascinated by self-starters, people that go out and start their own businesses or projects or hobbies. And I've always admired the entrepreneurial spirit because it takes a lot of courage to step out and do something that you've never done before. But as I got older and I started experiencing life for myself and how cold and cruel life can be, the more I started realizing that almost anyone can start anything, but very few can finish well. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to finish well. And Paul in the Bible was someone who finished well. And I wanted to read to you out of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. But before I do that, I want to give you some context here. Paul was nearing the end of his life. He was in prison, and he knew that any second, that Roman soldier was going to call his name. So these are Paul's final words. So you know that there's a lot of intentionality behind it. Verse 6 says this. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now, there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. See, Paul is showing us that his eyes are not fixated on his situation. His eyes are not focused on this world. Because the truth is, Paul had every right to be bitter. He had every right to be paralyzed by fear. But he remained focused on the crown of righteousness that was to come. It's in that moment that he teaches us a very important lesson in life that in order for us to finish well, we have to focus on the things above. Colossians 3, 2 says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And the reality is some of us have been so fixated in our situation that we've become worshipers of our problems. And we have forgotten the power of our almighty God. So if you hear anything today, I want you to hear this. We have to set our eyes on things above. I was at a mom and pop coffee shop not too long ago meeting with someone. And I went up there to give my order and I couldn't help but notice there was a very elderly man that was at the register. And I gave him my my order. Caramel latte without milk because I'm bougie. Okay, that's weird with my coffee. I have a whole other sermon on coffee beans about fruit having seasons. It's a whole thing. <clears throat> and he took my order, and then I realized that he was the one preparing my order. And I, I said, hey, uh, you know, I can just wait here. He said, no, sir. He goes, I'll take it right to you. So I went and sat down at my table, and I see him struggling getting to the top shelf to get the oat milk. And I see him struggling picking up the tools that he needed to do it. And I saw that he was kind of a little shaky, a little unstable when he was doing that. And and he poured that latte to the brim. And I mean, you can judge me all you want, but in the back of my mind, I was like, man, this man is going to spill this thing on the way to my table. And let me tell you something. He walked that thing straight to me 
did not spill not even one drop. And it impressed me so much. I said, sir, how did you even do that? I can't even walk without stubbing my toe on something. And he looked at me and said, oh, that's the, that's the easy part. I just have to put my eyes above the cup and everything will fall into place. See, when life starts to become shaky and a little bit unstable and you're not sure how it's going to get there and how you're going to cross that finish line, we have to set our eyes above so our life can stabilize out of a response to that spiritual alignment with the Lord. And I believe there's someone here today that needs to hear this. I love you and I'm going to tell you, keep your eyes above the cup, whatever that is in your life. Okay, you with me? We have to focus on things above. Now, I want to go back to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, but now I want to, I want to highlight verse 5 because there's a huge, huge takeaway here. And it says this, but you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Now, Paul is giving us a playbook of how to run this race well. And he says, we should keep our cool. We should endure. Do the, do the work. Grow in your spiritual giftings. And when I initially read that, I was like, okay, I get it. To, to run this race well, I just need to be a good dude and follow God, right? Seems easy. But the more I focused on this verse, I realized that all these things that he's talking about, it takes time. It takes time. And, and maybe, just maybe, this race of life that we are all in is less about speed and more about walking in stride with our Heavenly Father. Some of us are rushing through this life trying to accomplish and produce everything that we can so we can make a name for ourselves, and that's leaving a legacy only to be left empty, injured, and crying out for help on a racetrack. Colossians 1 calls us to make an effort to have endurance and patience. So if anything, God is calling us to slow down. Don't rush. My timing is perfect. We have to slow down and have a pace of grace. It's a pace of grace. Now here's a humbling thought. There's nothing that you can produce or make that God needs. You can, oh no, I already forgot what I said. There's nothing that you can make or produce that God needs. That should be humbling. God made everything. He made everything. He simply just wants to walk alongside you and get to know you. To run a pace of grace is less about speed and more about stride. Come on. Yep. That's so good. In 1992, it was the Olympics in Barcelona, Spain. And the stage was set for a British runner named Derek Redman. Now, he was favored to win the 400-meter race that year. And he had done his part. He had been training for years, his entire life. He had put himself into position, and he was ready to go. So Derek went onto the starting line, and he placed both feet on the starting blocks. Then he took off. And everything was going according to plan. But as he was nearing the last 100 meters of that race, he felt something snap, and he ended up tearing his hamstring in the middle of that race. And immediately he fell to the ground in excruciating pain. He was crying from the physical pain. He was weeping because of the emotional pain. He had put in all this work, all to fall injured in front of the eyes of the world. But Derek, did something. He remained focused and determined on finishing the race that he started. 
So he got back up and he started hobbling along. And you could tell that his flesh was trying and trying and trying. And then guess what? His flesh gave out and he was struggling. And it was then that there was a man up in the stands and he was moved with compassion for Derek. And he made his way down to the track. He even jumped onto the track. People were trying to stop him. He said, no, get off me, get off of me. See, that man's name was Jim Redmond. That's Derek's daddy. He said, no, you're not getting between me and my son. And so what he did, he went straight to his son and he picked him up and he put his arm around him and he looked at me and said, son, we're gonna finish this race together. And in front of the whole entire world, he walked in stride with his son who was injured, who was full of pain, but they were focused on the finish. I wanna encourage you today. You may feel like you're injured. You may feel like you're in the race of your life that you can't finish. You may feel like you're tore up, but let me tell you about what the Word of God says. And it says when Jesus died, he rose to the heavens at the right seat of the Father. And when his children cry out to him, he's gonna see and he's gonna be moved with compassion no matter what enemy comes his way because they know nothing is getting in the way between me and my son. Nothing is getting in the way between me and my daughter. And then he's gonna come right down, right to you where you're at. He's gonna pick you up. He's gonna put his arm around you. And he's gonna walk in stride and he's gonna look at you. He said, hey, let's finish the race. We have to stay focused on the finish. <laughs> Hebrews 12 says that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. So we focus on the Lord. We are already focused on the finish. Focus on the finish. Some of you, uh, some of you need to hear this today. You are running the race of life right now. And I'm telling you, you are not alone. The Lord is with you in this very moment. I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet as we close. But I want you to really lean in to his voice. I know I'm loud, but I should be mute in this moment so you can hear the voice of our creator. Really lean in. You know, there's a verse in the Bible that really sobers my mind up every time I read it. It's found in Matthew 7, 21, and it's the words of Jesus himself. He says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We, we cast out demons in your name. We perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. See, let me tell you something. You can come to church twice a week. You can serve at every opportunity that we have and stay the same. You can even pray over people and you can see the hand of God move in a miraculous way in their life and you can stay the same. But you cannot meet Jesus and stay the same. Only Christ can do that. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes in this moment because this is a holy moment. This is the moment that the Lord starts making his way down to you. And my prayer is that the Holy Spirit is already speaking to those who need to be spoken to. But for some of you here, there was a time in your life that you knew God was walking alongside of you. And then maybe life took its toll. Doubt crept in and things happened. And God became an accessory in your life instead of your Lord and your Savior. And you're feeling today that you're too far gone. You've drifted too far that I don't even know which direction to look out to find you, Lord. But today, you heard his voice and he's calling you back home to open arms. And for others that are here today, 
You've been running this race of life alone for a long, long, long time. You've been in charge of everything in your life and it's left you on the ground, injured and crying out for help. But today, but today you heard his voice calling to you from the stands and he's making his way right to where you are in this very moment. If that's you today, if you're ready to make that commitment and put Jesus at the throne of your heart, whether you're recommitting or this is the very first time, would you raise your hand right now so we can pray for you? Amen. Amen. Let's pray this prayer together as a church. Jesus, it's me. I've ran this race alone and it's gotten me nowhere. I need a savior. I believe that you are the son of God. And I believe that you were crucified for my sins and you washed me clean. And I believe that on that third day, you rose from the dead and my healing was complete. So from this moment forward, I no longer live for myself. I now live for you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.